Coming up on Market to Market, government estimates spark plenty of discussion among producers and analysts. We break down the numbers with our Blue Ribbon panel, Angie Setzer, Naomi Bloom, Ted Seifert, and Darren Newsom. next. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, September 15 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Keeping with our tradition of breaking down USDA's harvest forecast and ending stocks, we've convened a select panel of our regular market analysts. But before we drill down a bit deeper, let's take a look at how the market's wrapped up. For the week, December wheat posted an 11 cent gain, while the nearby corn contract lost two cents. Ongoing dry weather in Brazil helped soybeans sidestep a post-report dip as the November contract moved seven cents higher. December meal tested two-year lows this week, but did an about face, surging 620 per ton. In the softs, weather events in the Gulf joined five-year high production estimates to sink December cotton $5.52 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, October Class 3 milk futures dropped 19 cents. Livestock results were a bit mixed as the October cattle contract gained 42 cents, feeders rose 222, and the October lean hog contract shed $1.17. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained 55 basis points. Crude oil tacked on 238 per barrel. Comex gold plummeted $26 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs commodity index climbed 730 basis points to finish the week at 394.55. And it is against this backdrop we start our discussion. Joining us with their insights are four of our all-stars. Angie Setzer, Vice President of Grain for Citizens Elevator. Naomi Bloom, a market advisor for Stuart Peterson. Ted Seifred, Vice President of Zaner Ag Hedge. And Darren Newsom, DTN's Senior Market Analyst. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And a reminder to our audience that you can download or listen to this and other market analysis and Market Plus podcasts anytime online at iptv.org slash mtom. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we had an exciting week punctuated by the USDA's uh, release of their uh, September WASDE and crop production reports. Angie Setzer, you work with some wheat growers over in Michigan. Yep. Tell us a little bit about how this wheat market is shaping up. Was that some spread trade we were seeing post-report where wheat gained after corn started to fall a little bit? Well, I think we're starting to see some some real premiums um, show their face again in the Southern Plains for protein and, and different things like that. And that's what we had started to see initially in June there that, that really kind of started things going is that in the cash pipeline itself, we're not necessarily seeing the movement that would be there with the kind of carry out and things that the USDA has been projecting. So they've projected a bumper crop, sure, but you've seen some really significant spread development in Chicago. You know, as an elevator manager myself, I'm, I'm getting paid pretty lucratively to hold on to that into January and keep it out of the pipeline. And then you're seeing that introduction of the VSR, of course, in the Southern Plains come March. So a lot of elevator operators down that way are also looking at what kind of, of spreads or carry they could capture further out. And then, of course, we, we haven't solved the problem or we're not 100% sure what we're going to find once we get into the winter months up there in, in the Minneapolis market. So, Now you mentioned the VSR, that's the variable storage rate, yes. is that correct? And yes. so this isn't an entirely new thing in no. the market, elevators have dealt with it before, but how many how many different contracts of wheat is it on and now? Just the Chicago market. Just Chicago. So okay. just the folks in, in that soft red winter wheat or soft white winter wheat have, have experienced it. I'm a fan because I manage elevators, so it's really nice to, to see your margin increased when you're able to, for instance, I was able to trade September to March wheat spreads for 50 cents. So the, the board itself, not even basis improvement, gives me 50 cents to hold it until December, January timeframe. So when the VSR was introduced in Michigan, we went from 
really poor basis levels. In some areas, we were as much as two or two dollars and ten cents under picked up um, in 2010, 11 time frame. And this past year, I was able to pick up wheat off the farm for about 15 under. So the one thing that, that VSR does is it frustrates the heck out of anyone trying to figure out when it's a good opportunity to capture carry yeah. because we have seen that 50, 60 um, plus cents of carry introduced into the Chicago wheat market, but we've also seen it trade at an inverse. So you can, it can get some pretty solid swings going out there. Um, but the one thing I think the VSR will do for the hard red wheat in the plains is introduce that carry and finally pay some of these elevators that are holding that wheat on those old airstrips okay. for, for doing so, I guess you could say. Darren Newsom, as you look out at the wheat market, former Kansas boy, wheat producing man yourself, tell us, what do you think on this market? Oh, VSR is a joke. Okay, um, so, <laughs> all right, here we go. Why do you say that? Well, it's a great way to take a pig and call it a cow and expect everybody to believe it's a cow. I mean, by saying, okay, you've got a 20 cent carry between the December and March contracts, but that's not bearish. That's neutral. Right. We've got a neutral supply and demand situation, even though there's a 20 cent carry in the market and a dollar under basis. You're doing good, Mr. Farmer. <laughs> You're doing really good. It's a complete mis misrepresentation of the market. Um, it's a waste of time. So now for folks who are on farm stores of mm -hmm. wheat, how does this impact them? If they don't have it hedged, it doesn't do anything for them. Hurts okay. them. It hurts them. I mean, it, you know, uh, Angie talks about how basis has improved. Well, we've reduced our acres. We've reduced our production. There's not as much. And you can look. We still have plenty of supplies. It's not, we're not we're going to run out of wheat anytime soon, but we have reduced uh, our overall ending stocks from year to year to year. Um, so I think there's been a lot at play in the wheat market. It's certainly not corrected itself, and it's not all due to Chicago's VSR, and I, and I really don't think it's going to help the situation in the hard red winter market. All right. Ted, as you look out with uh, your producers across the country, are we going to see fewer winter wheat acres this year, do you think? Yeah, I think likely we will. Um, you know, just prices, it's another year where corn and soybeans win, right? Okay. It, even though the market's not really asking for corn acres, uh, but you look at the spread between the D17 and the D18, and we're tra trading 42 cents wide or so. It's really pushing towards the corn market. I mean, you got these 18 corn trading near four dollars. That's a really good opportunity for producers. So uh, we're going to see strong corn acres. We're probably going to see very strong soybean acres. Soybeans are looks like brewing a, a little bit of an acreage push right now. Uh, so the loser there is wheat. And you look at the world carryover, and that just it gives us more reason to to continue to cut those wheat acres. Although world carryover did come down just a slight bit here on the last report, which might be part of the reason why we reversed off the low there in wheat. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the one that needs to lose the most acreage and, and soybeans and corn benefit from that. Now, Naomi, as you look out globally, we are going to see acres come down in this country. As you look out worldwide, did USDA say anything that surprised you with regard to worldwide global wheat production? No, nothing that was a big surprise by any means. The, the biggest thing on the global front is how much wheat is being produced in Russia, over 80 million metric tons, and that's just... Uh, stealing the thunder from the whole marketplace right now. And so even though Australia's production was down, it was 35 million metric tons down to about 20, and Germany is at about 24, there's still so much wheat yet globally. Um, the, what Ted said about the outside reversal on charts, that's a little bit of a nice technical formation. So maybe we'll see some profit taking here as the, we enter the end of the quarter from the funds because they had been so yep. short so much. Okay. So it might allow for a nice technical bounce for anyone who needs to do any catch-up sales over the next few weeks. All right, price well, levels to make those catch-up sales. Naomi, what are you watching for? Oh, 25 cents, I think that's about all you're gonna 25 get. 25 cents over where we are yeah. today, mm -hmm. okay. The one thing that's interesting to point out about wheat, and, and you can't talk, I, to me, you can't talk about large global supplies without pointing out the fact that China is sitting on 48% yeah. of them. They are not coming into the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the top exporters, stocks to use ratio, it's one of the lowest levels that we've seen in the past 10, 10 to 15 years. Yeah, so. Yeah, if you if you do pull China out, which Darren had, had mentioned today, and I mentioned kind of incessantly for the past six months or so, um, you know, it, it is important to kind of pay attention to the fact that that China's large stocks, 48% of the world's wheat, 44% of or 42%, I believe now of the world's corn, aren't necessarily making it anywhere into the global pipeline anytime yeah. soon. And so that being said, keeping in mind, you know, keep China aside. You look at the rest of the world, and maybe the worst of the bearish fundamental news mm -hmm. is maybe behind us a little bit. So I, I don't know if we need to see much more than a 25-cent bounce or so, but you do feel like maybe the bottom could be in for wheat for the moment. 
Yeah. And then I'll keep, I, I really think that Minneapolis Spring Wheat still has a story. Mm -hmm. I think that market's in the process story. of yeah. flushing out the wheat longs. When does that come out with the uh, abandoned acres? Is Small grains. Sh shouldn't we see that at the end of the month? Okay. Yeah. I'm waiting for the cash market to tell us. Yeah, that's all right. I mean, that's, that's what you're starting yep. to see those premiums firm up in the Southern Plains. Obviously, that pipeline is has shifted from what we've seen here because you had a, a monumental move in both basis and futures that took place between yes. June and yep. July and right ahead of harvest. So if we wouldn't have seen a, a full pipeline at the end of, of July into August, I would have really been kind of questioning what we've been seeing from USDA and, you know, everyone kind of beating the, the large supply drum. All right. Well, let's jump time. into the corn market because we're, we're looking at another large supply in corn. And we've got a question here to start us off from Drew in Montezuma. He's on Twitter at Drew underscore Remp. Thanks for sending in the question. He's saying the last report put a kibosh to the pre-harvest rally, but how much damage did this do to our chances of a post-harvest rally? Naomi Blue, Darren, you'll be last. Naomi Blue, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I think your post-harvest rally is still going to happen. We still have our August 31st lows that are intact. Um, we may, in the next week or so, just revisit it, but I don't think that we're going to see any, like, amazing, amazing rally. Um, I'm looking maybe at most in the short term, 20 or 25 cents. And so I'm just being realistic about the big supplies that are still out there. Okay. And, and so we could get... Just a little technical bounce, but that might be it for the next month or so. Next month or so until we get a little closer to the end of the fourth quarter, yes. you're thinking. Ted Seifert? Yeah, so we've had this sort of tendency the last few years to put our lows in right in front of harvest. And, and there's a reason for that. Because we have these big crops and we, we have this old crop that we keep kicking down the road, waiting for that rally to happen. It never happens. So then what happens? We dump the cash right before harvest. You get more cash moving in front of harvest than you do on harvest, at least for, for things that haven't previously been sold. So new sales coming into the market. And then we kind of dry up and guys try to store as much as, and you're, you're gonna bring to town what you've already sold, but you're gonna try to store and hold on to as much as you can during harvest or whatever you're bringing in for new crop. And then, so we start to see this sort of recovery through the end of the year. I think this is another similar year. We don't have the same fundamentals as last year where we were having issues down in South America. Uh, so I do think we can see a recovery. But the corn price for me is all going to depend on what happens with soybeans here. Uh, I think soybeans are the ones that could potentially have a story. We'll get into that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but if the soybeans can take the lead and run with it, then I think corn can kind of come with. Um, but 375 to 395 is sort of my target between now and the end of the year for March corn. Gotcha. Gotcha. Angie Setzer? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I hate to go back to the cash market side of things, but I'm really waiting to see what basis does as we move into October. Everyone can kind of argue and say we've got variability, you know, throughout the, the crop production area, and, and we've heard yield reports that have been much higher than expected and much lower than expected um, early on here. So I'm waiting to see what your Illinois, your River, your Iowa, your big areas of production do basis-wise. Um, but I think the one thing that, that commercials tend to underestimate is the amount of farmer storage that's been out there. So, yeah, we may see the pipeline being full, as Ted kind of alluded to there right now. Um, but as we move into October, all of a sudden, especially if that crop's a little bit less than, than what's been anticipated, it can get put away. Um, there's a, I was just in Illinois this past week, um, and there are a lot of farmers in central Illinois that are actually purchasing baggers, and they're going to, you know, emergency store corn. Sure on the farm and so I think we you know I think we've seen it in South America first the the well I think we introduced it to South America right. the ability to hold anyway. yes. but they really really I mean, ran with showed it showed us that hey this could work yeah right. this can work to actually move a market a little bit so I, I'm going to be interested to see what what happens there and, and then we'll get a real feel for production and and then of course we'll get to squeeze all those fun uh, USDA numbers that Darren loves so much around. Th thanks for that lead in, Angie. Right. Darren, that's why I said you'll go last, what? because of course, this no. is a USDA report looking into the future, which you do tend to discount. Oh, why would anyone discount that? I mean, looking into the future is an exact science. I mean, being able to sit 15 months in advance and say, this is what we're going to produce, this is what we're going to have for demand, this is what's going to be left over. I mean, we see it in every aspect of our lives. I mean, grain is just one. I mean, we've got people out there who say Detroit Lions are going to win the Super Bowl every year they or, the, or the Chicago <laughs> Bears are going to win the Super Bowl every year. And it happens every year. Right. I mean, those they're, they're known as title towns for a reason, just like, you know, these you All right, Darren, reports. before before we're buried right. in hate mail from Lions and, and right. Bears fans, Lions tell us, what, what do you think? Are we going to be able to put in a post-harvest rally based on the, 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 the technical factors that you watch? I mean, you watch well, the spreads, okay. you watch the cash market. What are your, what's your take? All right, we're 
corn's comatose. So, I mean, if it goes up at all, that would be considered a post-harvest rally. We're locked in between 345 and 360. You break that out, points to 375, maybe yeah. 380. Cash market, I mean, we're, we're down between 3 and 320 mm -hmm. on the average price. Um, is that going to just take off and fly? No, because we've got last year's crops still to come in, maybe 2.3, 2.4 billion bushels. Who knows what we have? I guess somebody obviously knows what we have, that we're going to have 14, 1 billion bushels. Third largest crop on record, without a question, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Those numbers are absolutely right. So, so you know, yeah, we're going to probably get a post-harvest bounce. How big is it going to be? Corn doesn't like to go very far at any one time anyway. Not until okay. we get the droughts that are coming, and then we'll see if that doesn't change things. All right. Well, and now that kind of, I think, was a very heavily sarcastic way to lead us what? into the soybean <laughs> discussion. And, Ted, I want to come to you because you said you think there's a story brewing in soybeans. And we've heard Climate Prediction Center came out and said a La Nina situation has a 55 to 65 percent chance of developing here over this next quarter. Is that part of what feeds into this potential soybean part story? Of it, yeah. So, NOAA came out and last month they were at a 22% chance of La Nina. Now they're at a 66% chance of La Nina. So that, that is, the confidence of that is growing pretty substantially. That could be problematic for South America. Brazil's already fairly dry, so you have that sort of developing story. But then you look at this last USDA report and, and you, okay, where is the USDA getting 50 bushel an acre national average soybeans? And they're doing that because of the implied pod weight. And implied pod weight is a new record by a long shot. 4% over the previous record, which we set last year, mm -hmm. all right? Out on crop tour, I, I did uh, Farm Joe's crop tour this year, and uh, wow, um, I don't know, I, I agree with the pod count, where they're at on the pod count. I don't know how we're going to hit these, these implied pod weights. I, I just, we have flat pods, we haven't had the weather that we've seen the last three years with really fantastic uh, August, good weather in September, warm and wet. Mm -hmm. We were very cold, and then we got really hot now. Um, I just, I really doubt that we're going to get these pod weight numbers. So if you pull that number back down to where we were last year, which again, keep in mind, was a record, we're at about a 48, 48 bushel carryover, or a 48 bushel per national acre. average yield. Yeah. And if you do that, you're going to pull 170 million yeah. bushels out of production. You take that, and, and I don't think you can really do much on the demand side. I mean, we're seeing every day that demand is there. We saw crush today, yeah. strong, record for August. We see export sales numbers every day coming across the wire. So I don't think you can really touch demand. And if you take 170 million bushels out of production and we're at a 300 million bushel carryover in October, November, we're going to get concerned about that. Because how many times have we seen a 400 million bushel carryover dwindle to a 220 Wait, or 180? Has that ever happened? <laughs> I, exactly. No, because they know exactly <laughs> they, what's happening. Oh my right. gosh, I mean, they start off at 500 million yes. and it stays there, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Right. No. And yeah. so, of course, we do see, we have seen, and Darren, you've done the statistical research, we've seen it, what? How many 63% of the time it, right. it comes down yeah. fairly no, substantially? It, the last three years, and this year's going, you know, about to be done, but the last three marketing years, uh, it's averaged a 63% decrease from USDA's yeah. Yeah. high yeah. projection yeah. Right. to the November, to the, no, to yeah. the September uh, quarterly stocks. Yeah. Okay. I believe it's 70% so. of the time over the last 25 years they've so, overestimated I mean, soybean I mean, Let's go back to the projections. 70% of the time works all the time. Right? That's exactly so now let's, let's, let's talk to some price. Naomi, I saw you nodding your head rather vigorously while Ted was talking. You seem yeah. to be in agreement with most of his fundamental perspective. Yeah. What, at what price should producers be pulling the trigger? Or is this a year that beans make sense to pay for some commercial storage and hold out into next spring. What do you think? Well, I, I would say this. If you are choosing to sell your beans at harvest, I would be very much interested in using some sort of a re-ownership strategy with them because not only has there the potential to be the surprise of the yields really not being there at all, as we're all kind of in agreement on, mm -hmm. um, but the upside potential is there, especially with Argentina starting their planting and it's wet. They've had five inches of rain. So it's not that perfect start down there. And now I've heard that in South America, they have to spray for rust six times a year. And so what happens when all of a sudden that just doesn't work anymore? And if the La Nina really comes in, you got production issues. So things have the potential to just perpetuate to the upside. And I think about that demand in China, 110 million metric tons is what they use and 95 million metric tons is what is imported and supplied to them. So there is, there's no room for error. 
All right. So, so at what what contract would you be looking at owning if you're going to re-own? Would you be looking at a call strategy or an outright futures purchase? How would you do it? Um, well, I have a lower risk tolerance, and I think most producers do. So I would consider going something out to November of 18. Okay. And then doing a, like a, a call spread strategy, something where you can do a fixed risk or if there's a way that you can handle a little bit of margin potential, that's when you can sell puts under things. I enjoy the, having that time for a whole year. Okay. Jan right. calls are fairly cheap, though. What I was mean, that? W with volatility being as low as it is, uh, Jan calls are really quite cheap. And I think it gives you a really nice time frame to see what's going on in South America. Get us through our harvest and see what happens. Sell there. right off the combine. Look Get to that January Christmas. contract. I'm not saying to sell off the com potential. combine. I mean, listen, that's what everybody's done for the last mm -hmm. few years. I mean, that's what we do with soybeans. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I, I like that. I think if, if you're going to hold on to something that has upside potential, soybeans would be the one. I get the idea that we lose production the longer we let it sit in storage. But Jan calls are cheap. If you're okay. selling off the combine, if you, if you if you need to move grain or even you know Generate what, some cash what you're flow moving or, for for yep. old crop or the last old crop right now, I think soybeans are the one that you want to hold the upside potential for. And if, if grains as a whole are going to move, it's going to have to be coming from soybeans. Okay. Now, we could spend all night talking about this, but yep. we are coming close to the end of our time. So, ladies and gentlemen, tune in to Market Plus on the website. We need to get to livestock. And uh, so to do that, Naomi, I want to kick it to you real quick. Dairy market. Yes. We've seen a pretty pretty strong pullback here over the past couple weeks. Are we going to find any more upside? Can we make a run at 17 bucks? yet this year? Uh, I don't think so. Um, unfortunately, with the milk production, it's been up 1.8% was the July number. Mm -hmm. um, the August numbers come out next week. So we have too much milk. Um, and so what had been holding the prices up was that we had strong cheese demand. We had strong exports. We are seeing cheese prices slide. We are seeing exports not being as extravagant as they've been. And so the market has responded by pushing lower. Um, with Depending on what this report says next week, maybe we can get a bounce. Maybe we can get that market back up to $16, but fifteen fifty was now kind of the target technically. Okay. And I think we see a lull where we are stuck between fifteen fifty and maybe 16 because there is just too much out there okay. for supply. Let's take a look at live cattle. Darren Newsom, we've seen two weeks here of Relative stability. I mean, we're flat mm -hmm. on the week, week to week in live cattle. Are we putting in a nice base here for a low? Have we? Can we take 96 out of the equation on a live cattle for a low? And do we be looking for a bounce back in the upside? Technically, live cattle look like they're trying to to flatten out, as you said, and, and possibly try to go back up on their charts. The problem is, they keep running into commercial selling. We continue to see October lose ground to the Dece and the Dece lose ground to the Feb contract. So this isn't this isn't holding out a lot of hope for the cash market. And until you see that start to turn around, it's going to be hard to rally the market much. You might flatten out in here, but that side's going to have to come back, and that's going to have to start to buying, and maybe that'll get you a push up higher. All right, so everybody go get a ribeye. Ted, you look like you're thinking. Yeah, no, I, you know, the spreads are, are the only thing arguing against uh, mm -hmm. a live cattle rally, rally right. right now, so I, I see that. But sometimes spreads turn after the market does, right? And, and this week we ran into our, our major moving average and also downward the upper end of a downward trending channel. So. The first time you do that, you're going to see a pause. But I like the fact that we really didn't break off that. Mm -hmm. We kind of held just below it. I, I get the feeling that we're going to try to push higher. Uh, the anticipation is that we're going to see the largest fourth quarter drop in production that we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that does suggest that we could see things go higher. On the other hand, we have been watching weights come up. While we're still below last year's level, yes. you got to keep an eye on those weights. But I think the chart looks good. I, I like the action that we saw late this week. Uh, you look at the last cattle on feed report, marketing's being strong, placements are simmering down, yep. on feed numbers are simmering down. That's all kind of a good makeup for maybe a bit of a recovery in the market. All right. But I don't know how much higher we have to go. Right. Right. Angie here. Setzer, I want to turn to you with the talk of the feeder cattle market. We're just yeah. going to be going to be mirroring them with corn stuck in this rut. Live cattle are going to set the tone, aren't they? Well, that's, it seems to be, yeah. Live cattle are going to set the tone. Feeders have been strong, uh, but they seem to be plentiful. I've talked to a few of my cattle guys, and, and there hasn't been a shortage of feeders showing up at the sale, which is something that we've talked about pretty much, pretty steadily for the last couple uh, appearances of mine here because of the heifer retention and things like that. We, we knew that we were going to have a large introduction of, of calves into the marketplace. So, so yeah, I think live cattle are going to set the tone. We've got to see where cash goes. We have some room to, to feed them a little bit longer because weights haven't hit last year's levels, of course. Um, you know, you can't put them in the bin, unfortunately, to, right. to wait and, and capture that carry that's out there. You're going to bring them into the marketplace. But I'd really like to see some more interest on the cash side, and it's just been flat. Flat. Yeah. Okay. 
Flat is kind of the tone. Now, now before we get too far, I want to move into the lean hog discussion because this is a market where we are, we've talked about expansion for the past year. Mm -hmm. Now these plants are starting to come online. When or do we expect the cash market to take notice of this at some point? Uh, well, Angie? It, it seems the, the starts at the, the two plants in particular that we've really been talking about has been a little slow. Coldwater had some pretty significant issues um, last week. They're going to try to get up to, they're not even to full capacity yet, and, okay. they're, and they're going to try to be um, up in, in Iowa. They're up in, in what, northwest Iowa, yeah, I believe. Sioux City. Sioux City, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, they they are, I think they're 1,000. They, they need to add another 1,000 next week. They need to add another 1,000 to get to capacity. So you really haven't seen, you've seen the starting point, but you haven't necessarily seen that capacity to really kind of increase that cash, but we still have plenty of supply. I mean, we saw, what, six months ago, hogs were at a, a significantly high level, yeah. and with hogs, you can grow them pretty pretty quickly. Um, so, of course, the, the market encouraged an increase in production. We've seen that increase in production. Now it'll discourage it a little bit. We'll have that increase in, in kill capacity there, and, and it'll probably take some time, but we'll get that, that ebb and flow back into the marketplace, I All think. Right. Darren Newsom, we've got 20 seconds left. Based on your weekly chart, yes, sir. October hogs, higher or lower next Friday? Lower. Lower. Yep. That's the way we're trying. And that didn't even take me 20 seconds. It did not, <laughs> and, and we've got time to kill. So with that, I do want to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to join us this week, and all of our uh, viewers, please do find us on the website. Darren Newsom, Naomi Bloom, Ted Seifert, Angie Setzer, thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We will keep the conversation going, as I mentioned, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, which, as I mentioned, you can find on our website. And as a reminder, folks, we've launched our own YouTube channel. So check us out at youtube.com slash market to market and subscribe today. You'll get notified when Market Plus and other feature stories are posted. And ladies and gentlemen, join us again next week at we look at how those new pork processing facilities could impact Midwest producers. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.